Hi everyone, my name is Abel Souza. I'm a research fellow at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Today, I'm going to talk about our vision paper, Enabling Sustainable Clouds, the case for virtualizing the energy system. This talk represents more of a foundation for our vision rather than finished work, essentially where we are planning on going and why. As many of you know, cloud computing has many benefits, such as pay as you go pricing, low upfront costs, and the ability to wrap the scale up with demand. As a result, cloud capacity has been growing exponentially. As the left graph shows, the capacity of hyperscale data centers has been doubling regularly every four years for the last decade or so. This growth is being fueled for two primary reasons. The first is the benefits I just mentioned, which causes companies to switch to the cloud rather than build out their own infrastructures. The second reason is the growth in computer demand, primarily from AI machine learning workloads. The graph to the right extends the y-axis back to the 6, to put the growth over the past decade in better context. As we can see, before 2012, the computational demands are doubling at a rate similar to Moore's law. The point of all this is that if current trends continue, you can expect the cloud's exponential growth to continue and possibly even accelerate further. Of course, the main concern here is energy usage. The cloud's energy use is already massive at around 2% of the world's consumption, and the exponential growth is fast, and so people are obviously worried about the implications of that. However, as counterintuitive as it sounds, the rise in cloud energy usage is not really the problem. In fact, the problem is the carbon emissions from that energy usage and its negative impact on the environment. As I will discuss, the trends in cloud carbon emissions and the carbon efficiency are much less clear. As the recent 2021 IPCC report on climate change details, if you want to reverse the warming you are already committed to, we must reduce our carbon emissions across all of society to zero, or even negative. Besides, researchers and leaders have recently recognized the sustainability problem. There have been several research papers from both academia and the industry that focus on optimizing carbon rather than energy. There have also been new communities arise. In addition, there have been numerous industry announcements about becoming carbon neutral, or even carbon negative. So, complementary to energy efficiency, our focus is optimizing operational carbon efficiency. We argue here that reducing carbon emissions is different from reduced energy usage. Unlike energy efficiency, which is the amount of work or computation done per joule of energy consumed, Carbon efficiency is the amount of work or computation done per kilogram of carbon emitted. As a result, optimizing carbon efficiency differs from optimizing energy efficiency. To see why, just consider two scenarios. In one, a highly energy inefficient data center with PV way larger than two that is powered solely by renewables. In another, a highly energy efficient data center with PV near one powered by burning coal. The end result would be that the energy inefficient data center would be infinitely carbon efficient, whereas the second data center, although highly energy efficient, would be highly carbon inefficient. In this work, our vision takes a carbon first approach to systems design in two respects. First, we are elevating carbon efficiency to a first-class metric. There has been decades of research to optimize energy efficiency, but little on optimizing carbon efficiency. The distinguishing characteristic of low-carbon energy is that it is unreliable and varies widely both temporarily and geographically. As a result, carbon efficient applications will need to adapt to when and where low-carbon energy is available. Second, our foundation for enabling the design of carbon-efficient applications is to virtualize the energy system. The idea is to expose visibility and software-defined control of the energy system to cloud applications, so they can know how much energy 
and carbon they are using, besides controlling where the energy is coming from, such as from the grid, a battery or nearby solar array. This visibility and control will enable applications to manage unreliable low carbon in different ways. We kind of view this approach as extending the end-to-end -end principle to the energy system. Alternatively, taking the exokernel argument for delegating resource management to applications to its logical conclusion by also delegating energy management to them. The figure shows a high-level overview of our approach. We envision a distributed infrastructure composed of highly energy-dense but carbon-aware cloud data centers connected to the electric grid, as well as smaller, less energy-dense edge sites powered by a combination of renewables and batteries. In both cases, we envision applications running on this platform also having access to a virtualized energy system that includes a virtual battery, a virtual solar array, and a configurable grid connection with carbon information. This concept is very similar to how applications are already currently allocated virtual hardware resources in cloud data centers. The next logical question is, how can we expose this visibility and control to applications? Well, recently, new services such as Electricity Map have emerged that estimate grid carbon emissions by collecting and analyzing real-time data on grid operations. This carbon data reveals significant temporal and geographic dynamics. For instance, the left figure shows the average carbon intensity variations are significant in Ontario, which relies on nuclear and hydropower, having 21 times lower carbon intensity than Poland, which relies on thermal generators that burn coal. The right figure, similarly, shows that grid's carbon intensity also varies over time at any single location. On this day, South Australia's carbon intensity varied by four times, largely because solar and wind energy account for 48% of the energy generation. Besides that, self-powered edge data centers have complete visibility into their own local energy system, including its real-time renewables generation, grid consumption, battery charge levels and energy use of the computing infrastructure. This energy information is typically available via APIs exposed by different components, for example, battery controllers, and should be exposed and integrated into management software to provide applications visibility into the energy system. In this way, applications would have the freedom to write their own carbon aware policies. As we will see, the advantage of distributing a computing infrastructure among multiple edge sites across large and small geographic regions is that it can reduce renewable energy unreliability. This effect is also present when applied to just a few sites, as shown in the left figure, which plots the estimated solar output across 16 AWS regions spread across the world, the gray lines, and the aggregate in red. The figure shows that aggregate soil output is much less volatile than any individual site. The right figure shows the solar volatility and also decreases when aggregating across many sites in a small region. As we have said, we are arguing that an API should provide the energy system visibility to applications so they can influence and control their own energy and compute demand. To demonstrate the benefits of such visibility, the figure on the left depicts the execution over time of an elastic and an inelastic distributed machine learning training, along with grid's energy variable carbon intensity. We use the ML proof power performance results to model ImageNet. The inelastic variant, the blue dashes, uses the same resource throughout the day. The elastic variant, the black dots, as an outer scaler to dynamically scale resource up and down depending on the carbon intensity. This experiment shows that by scaling resources in response to variations in the grid carbon intensity, the less carbon wire distributed training variant lowers the overall carbon emissions by 45% without any effect on its completion time. 
The figure to the right depicts the performance of a serverless application that runs on edge sites powered by renewable energy. Requests are generated based on the latest sensitive serving tasks in a Google workload trace. The gray lines depict solar outputs at each site, while the blue and red lines depict the percentage of requests dropped by an adapter and non-adapter application. The non-adapter application evenly and statically divides the workload across sites, while the adapter application routes workload to sites based on their energy availability. We can see the drop rate only when the aggregate power across sites is enough to serve the load. The figure shows that the non-adaptive service drops up to 32% of requests due to lack of available energy, even though energy is available at other locations. The adaptive service, however, never drops requests and has a zero carbon footprint, illustrating the benefits of carbon air policy. And to conclude, our vision paper advocates for a carbon-first approach to cloud design a design that elevates carbon efficiency to a first-class metric. Carbon efficiency has generally been ignored by system researchers in the past because it requires tight integrations, besides the visibility into an opaque energy system that provides a simple but reliable abstraction. However, the environmental cost of maintaining this simple abstraction has become too high as it masks the energy unreliability and carbon emissions from applications. Thus, we argue for virtualized energy systems to expose the visibility and control applications need to optimize carbon emissions based on their own requirements. Thank you for watching this talk.